doing as well as I can be. I'm feeling fortunate. I'm here in Munich. Uh, with my partner, and we took a walk by the river today, and there's people in bathing suits laying, like, as if nothing <laughs> is going on, which can be really comforting. At the same time, can be unnerving, because, yeah. you know, we were trying to figure out how to get through this, but what are the best ways of doing it? But as of right now, the Munich and the German people are continuing to live their lives fairly, fairly freely, openly, and together. Oh, okay. Yeah, with the I, wearing masks and the two meter distance, but like there was so there's so many people out and about. I was gonna ask like if people are wearing masks. Yeah, some, not a lot. Uh-huh. You just you more and more you're seeing it. Like I came prepared with my gloves and my masks and extras for my partner and her family, and I had a feeling that they would wouldn't be really taking it too seriously, but mm-hmm. now they are. Now they're starting to. For sure. I mean, you have two shows up right now. The show at the drawing center. Uh, is i mean it's it's a huge show it's a lot of work yeah it is um, yeah if you want to just jump in and like uh i really love the title the title can't i alter like it's a beautiful phrase and i, I think it's a great place to start okay so um as you see so first of all you and this is the environment of sir dingle sir dingle the juve knight he is a, a character that i've created that is um travels through the world of capriccio um, through forward and backward through time and c- communicating with different ancestors for, again through both forward and through backwards through time mm-hmm. um, the idea came was inspired by seeing a picture uh, a painting uh, image of a painting online chef Rue del rey uh, and it was of an african knight a moorish knight riding through portugal uh like like there there it is there yeah uh, and so that square still exists, and the water fountains are there. And so the knight, as we see here, yeah, exactly, um, became this fixation for me because I hadn't seen work of this era where well, it wasn't referencing Saint Maurice or um, or sort of the birth of Christ, where you'd see an African in a prominent kind of stature or represented as a as a knight. And so it uh, it was right around the time in the summer of. Um, Philando Castile, the time where Philando Castile is killed on Facebook, and mm. we're watch, seeing just a flooding of, of these police brutality images. We know it continues to this day, but there mm-hmm. seemed to be this real big push for the visuals of it to be on social media and the newspapers, and uh, I was starting to feel the stress of that. I had recently been stopped by the police riding home from the studio at four in the morning coming from pioneer works i'm covered in paint and i'm riding up myrtle ave and uh the cops pull right behind me and follow me the entirety of the hill and then pull over beside me and i'm just like drive straight just drive straight and they roll down their window they don't say anything they just look at me and in that moment i'm like they could take my life and nothing would come of it and so i started uh taking cabs everywhere, Uber, and I wasn't, it wasn't even conscious that all oh, the next day I took an Uber to, to the studio and back mm-hmm. and back and forth. And then I realized, whoa, what is happening? And my work is now starting to reflect this anger and this trauma and now diving deeper into, I'd already been working with the, the death of Eric Garner and, uh, and, uh, and Michael Brown, looking at the way that the images were presented and how similar to Goya's work, like mm-hmm. you could, oh, the compositions freakishly sometimes would line up you know, and so I was doing this work and I was like, I can't live in this space forever because it's damaging me personally. Absolutely. And so Trump was about to be elected and I decided it was time to get out of America for a while. And the first place I went was South Africa. Mm-hmm. And so I had just seen this work. And so I started thinking about, well, maybe I want to work in this medieval space and uh, make these fantasy characters and just begin to play and just work out of imagination versus newspaper headlines and research of, of that 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 type of uh that that subject matter and so the first day i get to um so i'm in i arrive from uh in south johannesburg and i'm driving to the residency and i see these men at the side of the road beating and just like that the idea came where i'm like i want to make this african night character i want it to feel like carnival and i'm going to use beads and these craftsmen to build the first suit of armor which we then see here at the at the at the entrance way yeah right there we see it there at the entranceway. So this was going to be the costume of the beginning of Sir Dingle that would then find its way into paintings and dioramas. Hmm, I see. Okay, yeah. and can you uh, 
can you tell everybody a little bit about the celebration Juvera? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's um, it's like it's a, a carnival. It's during uh, Carnival, and for me, my connection to the the Juve, as they say in Trinidad, was the first time I met my ancestors, my cousins, who had been prior to that point had just been phone calls to cousins and relatives, not being able to put faces outside of a photograph when mom maybe was there last time, and I still mm-hmm. hadn't been to Trinidad at this point. So we get to Trinidad for Carnival, and. Uh, the and prior to the festivities, prior to the Juve celebration, which it happens right around East, um, it's like what before Lent, you know, it's the last celebration before you give up everything. Um, and um, it's pretty perfect timing that we're doing this on Easter. I know. <laughs> 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 and so they cover their faces, my relatives cover their faces in this red clay, this red paint. And as the sun's coming up, everybody goes out and we're dancing. And for a conservative, North American suburb <laughs> suburb kid, like what is going on? My grandma, who just the day before was kind of frail, what felt frail, knowing that she's grandma was not, but then she starts, and this energy came from it, and so the faces became like this this illuminated connection to ancestry. So then we flash forward to Pioneer Works, and right there, yes, during the um, so I'm we flash forward to Pioneer Works, and I'm just working on canvases. I have some aerosol, and I hit the paper with this. The, the, with this red color and that memory of ancestry came. And mm. so I was already working on these kind of medieval style portraits. So I'm like, well, let's imagine that, that St. Maurice, who always appears in these paintings, he has a crew of people of color and some of them are my relatives. And so again, now I'm just beginning to play with this idea. And so the connection of Juve was uh, with this exhibition is that I wanted Sir Dingolay after this. So this work is a culmination of two, three years of travel and research that he's the end of this journey. And it's like the end of carnival when you're exhausted and tired or the end of battle because I've now become aware and uh, I've dispelled some theories that things that I was working on and ideas I thought I was going to continue to run with through my travels and digging deeper, I start to realize that maybe the African side of things isn't the major focus as i discover i have a white great uh french great grandfather who lived in trinidad and i discover portuguese roots and all these other things uh so then it starts to open up a little bit more but um sorry i'm I'm, I'm hitting a bunch of things but no it's great so so this idea here is when you arrive to can i alter that this is the estate of sir dingley and the paintings and the objects, because it's from South Africa, from China, all these places I've been, end up at his home, and he's fallen into his house exhausted, and he's taken off his armor at the front door, and you don't know whether he's come from battle or if he's come from carnival. I see. Okay. It's an interesting narrative, because then it's sort of, you have both in mind the possibility of celebration and the possibility of defense and Absolutely. Um, standing, you know, standing tall. Because when I started to look at that first painting, Chefferie del Rey, when I first, when I, so I get to Portugal, uh, I find out that the knight in the painting is from the Order of Santiago. Mm-hmm. So that for me was like, oh, this is going to allow me to really imagine and play with fantasy and the romance of being in Lisbon under the sun. And, and so I, uh, I, I, I meet a person and we decide to go for dinner with her co-workers and I go with her and her co-workers and her boss and I are talking. And he's like, why are you here? I tell him about this painting. He says, my family owns the painting. <laughs> in a private wow. estate, this painting is sitting with a Titian nearby, like... This is the type of wealth these people have. So I go to this home, and then I start to discover, what seeing the painting versus the image, I start to discover there's a man in the back left. So if you scroll left, keep scrolling, and stop. He has a bucket on his head. That's a (laughs) shit bucket. Jesus. Then if you scroll down to the, like, uh, just to the left diagonally of him. So uh, diagonally of him, yeah, go left now. Oh, sorry, other way in the painting? Yeah, keep going, keep going right to the edge of the... Nope, keep scrolling to the... That's yeah, the uh, end yeah the there, right here. there. Yes, okay, so, sorry, your marker is what I meant by scrolling. So, scroll, scroll. Oh, Take your marker, right? Yes, that area there. You see this guy is just... He actually has blood coming from his head. And he was just attacked and accosted by, what is it, security? I don't know. Uh, so right. I started to, it started to see like, wait, the, the black figures that I once imagined where there was this 
equal hierarchy where it was like there was wealthy Africans, there was wealthy uh, Jewish folk, as we see in Port Iberian mm-hmm. folk. I it started to be like whoa 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 no, and maybe that knight who's kind of like turning his eye away from all the madness is like his gaze became something different when I finally saw the painting and it wasn't this harmonious existence that I previously thought. Interesting. And that began, began to shift a lot of things where I'm like, Oh, you can't escape this. If it's after 1500s, you can't escape this idea of the, and representation of the African in these works. Right. And prior to that, like, I still think that this, this painting is anonymous. They say, right. I think it was painted by an artist of color. Really? Because right now yeah, it's, it's considered really a Flemish painter. Right? Yeah, and but as I start to do my research, there was there was African people in Holland and Germany in on these times from the twelve hundreds. Right. You know, like it was mm-hmm. there was uh, they existed, and so I don't think that this painting is anonymous because the way he's taken and he tells a story of the African where there's an interracial couple dancing, and then there's a figure of the knight who really holds the painting, and yeah. He really is the central figure, even though he's not in the center even, of the yeah. painting. So it, it, it becomes, I'm still fascinated with, but this, uh, yeah, it, it opened my eyes and was an accurate representation of my time in Portugal, where all of a sudden now I am a person with access because I'm not identified as Angolan, Cape Verdean, mm-hmm. any of the places that Portugal colonized. Right. So then it became aware that I'm like, right, you can't escape this, you're you know, yeah, you're, 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 the, the blackness is just on the other side of the river and they're as traumatized and being the police brutality is happening there. And so this night became a character to feel like I would make paintings that would protect them where he's slaying the the enemy and doing different things like that. So I, the knight in question here, his name is, uh, I'm, I may be pronouncing this poorly, but Joao de San Panasco, San Panasco. In this painting? Uh, in the painting, yeah. yeah. And so I was looking him up, and um, I guess he was he started as King John the Third's court jester, and then uh, was eventually promoted to gentleman courtier, and then, as you said, uh, became part of the Order of Saint James. And what I found so fascinating about that, and also which I think ties like very much to your work, is that because he started as a jester, he was able to make fun of nobility without being killed, and so he he had this relationship of being both inside the structure and outside the structure. That's how I feel. (laughs) And I was like, oh, well, I mean, that's, (laughs) that's gotta be where Curtis is at right now. That's exactly how I feel in the contemporary art world. Then not only that as a Canadian, as Mm a, as a, the African or the black Canadian experience is nuanced. Uh, So reading a lot of Glissant was like, there, there is a relation. I'm in relation with the American experience, but I, that is not my experience. Mm-hmm. So I'm able at times to feel inside it and maneuver and receive the pros and cons, but then also able to step out and then now I'm perceived as something else. And so identity became this moving, moving, moving target because there's parts of Africa I'll go and I am, I am clearly from the diaspora. Right. My nose looks more Portuguese to them than it does. But this part of my face is Senegalese. But this part of my nose is Portuguese. <laughs> and then the texture of my hair, a barber was cutting my hair once. And he was like, oh, what are you mixed with? <laughs> but I tell a, a black barber that in the United States. And they're like, man, yo, your hair is so thick. How do you get your, you know? And it's right, just right. all these things, you know, yeah, that I was hoping that in these show, these subtle nuances, if you do the you dig a little deeper, you will come mm-hmm. to that conclusion. And I wanted it to be a bit of, some things are open and very easy to engage with, but then other parts I wanted it to, to feel where, for those who know kind of things, so those who know Juve will know the dances and the painting. <laughs> It also feels like, I mean, the fact that the entire show, in a sense, is under construction, that yeah. this is something that's always in transit or always sort of being built and destroyed at the same yeah, time. Seems, yes. And that yeah. felt really appropriate and kind of also connected to the anachronism of both the space and the paintings and the landscapes that you're using, which also feels like it goes back to this painting because, in a sense, this really does look like 
a medieval painting, like let's say more 12th, 13th century, mm -hmm. but the fact that this is from the 16th century and it has that structure, it's just, it feels like it's in the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, found, I just found the show so fascinating because like, I, I mean, unfortunately, I didn't get to see it in person, but um, it just seems like such a congealing of so many things that you've been thinking about for a while, but like somehow, like it really manifests quite beautifully here. And your somehow is, if I said, oh, I had planned everything to fall into place like this, I, it's not, that would be a lie because up until the moment when everything was finally installed and able to stand, sit back and be like, oh, oh, these objects are speaking together. Because they were painted in such... Di Some things were made a month before. Other things were three years prior thinking about this exhibition. The video, not knowing how the video would fit in the drawing center if it would connect with the, with the, the, wor the other pieces, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I felt I can... I can uh, often I, I find there's this... this I'm never satisfied with, fully satisfied with something, you know, a project, mm -hmm. a work. But this, because it was so many hands and came through so many places, so many different artisans collaborating, I, I can say that the idea did work. And I am really happy with this because I did not plan for it to congeal this way. I'd hoped it did, but mm -hmm. I was also open to like, this may not work. This may just seem like <laughs> someone has crammed a bunch of random, you know, works from different time periods and... Yeah, or like a retrospective or something, or a mid-career survey, which I didn't want it to feel like that. Right, right. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about this character, um, mm -hmm. who I think is Jab-Jab? That... Yeah, he plays many roles. A trickster, he's almost like Eshu at times. He's almost like Sebris. Um, he was like, in some paintings, he plays the role of like the, as the Hotep, like the, like where mm -hmm. it's like, Ooh, like, uh, like Kemet, you know, where it's like, and I wanted him to, to, to feel that way. But here in this painting specifically, he's the bringer of life. Um, <laughs> I've been manifesting family. A lot of this work is, uh, there's a few pieces that deal with the idea of family. And I'm happy to say that my partner and I are, are now going to be starting a family. Come September, we'll have our first child. But this year, thank you. Thank you. So here the idea is that the, the Juve Knight is taking the energy of life from this dream-like Jab-Jab character. Because uh -huh. the Jab-Jab also has a net in, that people throw money in, but he collects souls. So it's like, right. in this, he's giving me back a soul. He's giving me like an old soul. And in her belly there, it's not a fully formed red circle. There, it, I hit it with spray paint, but it kind of looks like it's just congealing. Like it's just starting to turn into a full red face right 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 oh that's really nice and so it's what you can't see in here is that it's black charcoal on matte black paint so there she has um she has a full figure and if you're to see it in person you see that she has a belly kind of like you can see his arms the details the of of the his arm the lines in his arms here huh yeah, but it's, it's hard to see in uh, but in 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 person. Oh, like okay. Yes, so like just like that. Yes, exactly. That black okay. charcoal over the mat. She has a figure and she has a full belly. I see. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating figure because it's there's the idea that it it doesn't it has like a really ambiguous status. It doesn't seem like it's either good or bad. It's just it it plays a different kind of role. And that's exactly cuz the first time I saw Jab Jab, I was terrified. Right, because he came at me on the streets, and he's covered in oil, and he's and I'm 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 terrified. But then I see later renderings of Jab Jab, and then I start researching where that character essentially comes from and its roots at uh, folkloric in Africa, its folkloric roots. And I was like, oh, you're the trickster. You can be terrifying, but you can also you can also bring joy and laughter and those things. So right. yeah, and do you? Um, I know that you started as a musician as well. Like, how do you think about, how do you think about music in your current practice? Uh, I'm now getting more comfortable with it. At first, I had removed music completely from the practice because I didn't want it to be the the Bob Dylan thing. Not to say that Bob Dylan can't paint, but or Tony Curtis. It was like, no, it was like I didn't. I wanted to be this to be taken seriously, and. Mm -hmm. It was a combination of things. At the time I was recording my album, when I first started to really wanted to dive into to visual arts, I was recording my art album in the day and trying to paint at night. 
So I was sharing the studio with the artist The Weeknd and this one producer, Ilangelo. Ilangelo was producing both of our records. Abel, The Weeknd, was just focusing on music. Ilangelo was just focusing on music. The energy that they were able to put into it because they were solely focused on one thing. I had an art project coming up. These uh, wealthy women in Toronto, a group of women who support contemporary art, had put on an event that they were going to feature my work. Uh, and I was trying to do both. And in the end, I felt like each one was kind of half-assed. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't... And that's when I had to make the decision, okay, I'm going to put the music to the side because I really want to pursue visual art. It was just creeping up. I found myself less and less trying to read about... Uh, musical theory, chord structure, and more and more trying to figure out how Mene made the brown, how he did, you know, these different, those things. <laughs> and so then, uh, yeah, and so, but now I feel that it is, I'm more in a holistic place where it's all a part of me and my work can reflect all of these things. Yeah. And music is finding its way back in, in this exhibition, in the collaboration using the mighty Sparrow and my friend uh, Gregory Fox, who plays the drums in the video, and writing a song, beginning to write a calypso for, for uh, the Juve night. Oh, and cool. and it's, it's finding its way back organically, and I, I'm happy about that, you know. But I did feel at the time that I had to sever the two in order to be taken seriously. And I did, just to, just to make time in a day. Yeah, for real. I mean, like, this is a lot of work, so I can't imagine that <laughs> there's much yeah. else that you could do. Exactly, exactly. And at times it'd be like, oh, you could just... And, and remembering that when I did that, it didn't feel complete. And I wanted, this needed it for me when I walked away from this to feel like I had given it every possible ounce. I want to, uh, since obviously people can't really experience these in person right now. Yeah. Can you talk about the, the bricks that find oh, yeah. their way into the paintings? So it's a paper composite. It's, um, we spent about two years... No, about a year, oh, let's be real, about like a year, year and a half, uh, my, with my fabricator, Brian Humphrey, um, uh, developing a paper that mm -hmm. would be able to be cast in a mold, but then take the various materials that I, that I use equally, mm -hmm. be it oil, whatever, be porous enough, but also then be strong enough. So it's also lined with uh, cheesecloth in between. So the bricks right. could break off. I could ch cut the bricks cut and still hold my form. Uh, so, yeah, so that is... that is, And then it's mounted on Baltic birch so it doesn't warp. Uh, and other than that, it was just like a secret formula of really wanting to... Knowing it was going to be the drawing center and saying I want to do an installation. They were so worried, is there going to be drawings? Is there going to be drawings? Because I'm like, I'm starting to show them pictures of rusty scaffolding that we're collecting and all this. And uh, I knew, well, if I said, it's on paper, it's works on paper. <laughs> that that would, because you have to understand, it spent, it was about almost two years of trying to make the institution feel comfortable with mm -hmm. what this was going to be, because it is a departure from how the drawing center tends to show work. Sure. So... So it was, yeah. Uh, and oh, so in the, the show's end, been, they, you've been sort of uh, building the show for the last two years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the results are really great. I think I, the, oh, the brick so, and the way it's accepting images is really nice. So it's three types of brick. It's Brooklyn brownstone. We just did, mm -hmm. we did uh, urethane rubber molds. Brooklyn right. brownstone. I had a friend who has a brand new fancy studio and he had cinder block. So we did the cinder block from his studio. Then uh, my studio, which was in Red Hook, the walls from the studio were made from the ballast that they would bring over in the boats from early boats from Europe. They'd offload and take the tobacco and the things back. And so then they built the walls of this garrison, of this, this warehouse, with uh, these, these stones in uh, early 1800s. So That's amazing. That feels and, so and, perfect. Yes. And so then they gave us that kind of an ancient. And from that point, I wanted to, I was looking a lot at the work of, uh, of uh, G's Bend and, and uh, Basil Kincaid and uh, tapestry work. And being mm -hmm. like, well, and medieval tapestries, I'm like, how can I patchwork these walls together? So it is, again, this capriccio of contemporary, of current and old, and then feel a little bit like a quilt, feel like a collage in a sense, and, and then try to figure out how to... So it was all exper such experimentation, not knowing how this would come to how the walls would physically come together and even until like two days the last two days before install we're still 
trying to figure out how to make this material stick or, you know, yeah. Wow. I, uh, the way that you're talking about patching these things together and uh, talking about family, there was a phrase in your press release uh, where you used the phrase genetic imagination. Yes, yeah. And it feels like a really great way to, to talk about this body of work. And it reminded me, um, it reminded me of Alice Walker. And mm -hmm. I, right now, I'm, I'm literally right now reading The Temple of My Familiars. Okay. And just this, like, there's a mythic imagination there where characters have lived multiple lives and kind of have access to them. And so one woman will have been a slave on a slave ship, will mm -hmm. have died, will have lived in this other era and lives now. And it felt so much a part of how you're thinking about this exhibition too, in that you're not bound by that genetics, but it's like, it's a starting place to then grow and to kind of uh, reconsider histories and reconsider futures. Two moments in my life that kind of reaffirmed this feeling that I've always had since I was, you know, when you know when you have, so for example, my partner was telling me today that when children are growing up, when they're little, you, they can't vocalize that they're thirsty. They just feel hmm. uncomfortable, but they feel it or that they're cold. So you have to ask them, are you cold? And you put something, you know, the, that sort of thing. And that's what I kind of felt about this idea because I'd always have felt like, oh, what if I think really hard? Maybe I can enter the mind or the life or the body of, because uh, I, I didn't grow up with my relatives right. around me. So always dreaming of being around them and seeing them. But um, so uh, the artist Nep Sidhu, his father came to an exhibition. We were, him and I were in an exhibition together. And I had this piece called uh, uh, Nubian Origin Story. And I was mm -hmm. referencing the Dogon uh, mythology of the water god descending from the moon. And so the water god's standing at this wa at the shore and there's this temple behind him. And he looks at me and he says, Nep's father says, you're trying to communicate with your ancestors. And I, and I said, yeah, yeah, very early on. And he goes, you can, you, you can go forward and back meditate on it think about it believe it feel it if it feels if you you start thinking oh maybe it's kind of hokey or whatever feel it and believe it so that was the first time i heard that then i got to south africa and i met a sangoma who is like a healer uh, uh i hate the term witch doctor but north american word you know but like a, a sure. healer mystic person and mm -hmm. they brought this idea of like if you burn a certain bush uh, in the studio under the work you can channel, you can channel. And I started to believe in it and believing it and believing it where at times I would break down in tears drawing a portrait of a father and son because I could feel the love that maybe they had. And just the idea of like allowing myself, whether or not anyone else believed it at the moment, that I was able to and I am able to connect in that way. And so I kept thinking, you know, when we talk about genetic trauma, like and ancestral trauma, and, uh, but I'm like, that's not the only things that we would store in our cellular so why wouldn't it be the imagination, the joy, and the creativity? Let me focus on that. Because I was living in trauma of when I would see this profound feeling of sadness when you see, as a, as a person of color, as a black person in America, another person lynched, essentially lynched. Mm -hmm. It hit in a way that was just like, it, like oh, a sadness that would be so low inside, so deep inside. Yeah. That would trigger, you know? So then yeah. I was like, no, when I see these old time carnival costumes, how many ancestors of mine played carnival? How many? Right. And before that, then how many? Even the French ancestors, because they say carnival was brought by the... How many? And so, yeah, I, I tend to... I wanted to... Because not all the work is positive and light and easy. But sure. I knew that that's a joy as a way to bring people in to then give them a little dose of the realities. And a little bit of the... And you know, like... I personally, when I start seeing shows about dismember, but you know, like I don't want to engage with the work. Mm -hmm. I don't need to see another lynching postcard. Right. I don't need to watch another video uh, of, of police brutality. I, ca I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. You know, I, I hear that. I also so, think it's like, it's a richer picture of history and life where, absolutely. yes, of course, it's not, it's not a denial. It's not saying uh, that these things aren't happening, but yeah. it's very much giving the opportunity for people to understand that life as we know it and everything that you've experienced and everything that your ancestors have experienced runs the gamut from yeah. horror to, you know, infinite joy. Yeah. And I'm choosing at this point in my life to focus on the infinite joy and like the possibilities within that, you know?
Yeah. I think that's great. I think it's it's made for a really rich body of work, and I I'm I'm a fan of it. I want to get to uh, sure. the the next show, um, which is called Erratum, and uh, I really liked these sculptures against the wall here. Ah, uh, the noses. Of the noses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And so there, Can those you are talk made a little of, bit about. Absolutely. Um, that idea has been floating in my head for many, many years. Um, early Netscape days. Uh, <laughs> and I've since tried to go back and maybe sometimes it feels like I imagine it, but I know I didn't imagine it. That um, National Geographic on their website had issued an apology. An apology on how the, they presented the findings of Egyptian artifacts from the Germans and, mm -hmm. uh, and the Brits and how they would, at the time when they'd find artifacts, they would cleave noses off to hide the identity of connecting it to Kemet and Nuba and these places. So that was my idea because there's this portrait of a, of a German Moor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the name escapes me and I just was recently in Berlin and I took another picture of it where when I read poetry about him, they talk about him as being this dark, dark as night. His armor was black. His hair was black. Blah, blah, blah. Then you see the pic one painting of him, and he's like, oh, he's kind of light-skinned Drake. Like, <laughs> he's kind of Drake-esque. You're like, okay. Then you go into a room, two rooms over, and he is now just rendered as a big, fat Aryan man. No shit. So this was like, you know what, the idea that um, Sir Dingale went around retrieving the noses that had been taken off all these sculptures and brought them back home. And these are the noses of his ancestors. Because, again, in South Africa, uh, uh, a Zulu woman pointed out my Portuguese nose. Mm -hmm. But then in school, kids would be like, yo, you have a big black nose. You know, like, just, <laughs> and it's just so ridiculous. Like, where does my nose belong? On my face. Everyone has one, you know? <laughs> but there's so much weight there. But there's so much weight behind, you know, this object when it's presented in this kind of museum historical kind of context. Right. It, to me, it's like, uh, there's, a, there's a concept that Fanon came up with called sociogeny, where okay. it stands next to ontogeny and phylogeny. So ontogeny is like the birth of the individual or the yeah. organism. Phylogeny is the like mapping kind of the species and the evolution. And so next to all that is like, things that are outside of biological description that are about like the social construction about like social life being part of the individual and the fact that all of these things have been written, taken, broken, redone, undone, mm -hmm. like that becomes part of this diasporic experience as much as everything else. Yeah. And to see these noses, it feels like such a, like a humorous but also like violent reminder absolutely of all of that and I, I it's like it's a really nice piece thank you thank you yeah it's the rest of the show also kind of alludes back to uh uh sir dingle absolutely so this was almost go. like an extension of more artifacts that's what an eratum was just an extension to and so that's the the introduction of the jab jab knight who begins to see the darker sides of the world. And so some mm -hmm. of the works that uh, are developed around him and the video that will be developed around him aren't so naive and joyous and, and, and bubbly. They're a little more, and so, yeah, a little, a little darker. Yeah, this painting in particular seems a little more dark. Absolutely. It's uh, the, the bird mask hair, oh, similar to what they were wearing at the time of the plague, this is oh, what yeah, I right. would, this was just a slight hint to that as I was starting to, like, when I saw what was happening in the Wuhan in China, I immediately started taking it seriously. Really? Yeah, immediately. As soon as I saw wow. that, I'm like, mm, no, because Bill Gates was, had years before was talking about, I think in like 2018 or maybe even 2015 or 2018, his TED Talk, where he's talking about how it's not going to take much for the way we move globally now for mm -hmm. a plague too. And this is the knight here kind of planning his escape. Like when I always thought about, something I thought about very young was when Picasso made the decision to get out of Spain. Mm -hmm. As the worlds are shifting, my decision to get out of New York, like literally the day after this show, was because part of my sense was like, mm, some, whatever's going to happen right now, I, I know, first of all, as a Canadian without health care here, mm -hmm. is, I, this is not going to be good. 
Right, right, right. And so this is uh, Sir Dingle, like, in his dark armor, and he's, like, looking, and he's like, peace. Like, <laughs> I'm wrapping this up, and I'm out. Yeah, the shoulders definitely have that vibe where it's like, I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zoinks. Yeah. 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 Are you able to work right now? Or, like, are you taking a break? I mean, this is... <laughs> you've been working a lot, so I can imagine you could use a breather. I took my breather. My breather is thinking outside of my own personal needs. Mm-hmm. My partner, massaging her feet every night. Mm-hmm. thinking about her and then going to work and leaving the studio at seven o'clock so we can have dinner. I'm mm-hmm. now thinking about making the changes in my practice and my life that I didn't have to think about before when I just be like, she's like, where are you at? Cause she was living in Germany. I'm in New York. Uh, it's one in the morning. I'm still in the studio, you know? Right. Now I'm like, well, I still want this. So I have to, and the way timing kind of works out, it's like, let's say if things are somewhat, I hate, I don't even want to use the word normal. If we begin to open up fairs and all this stuff and do these, the the art industry continues, you know, that part of it. Um, I have a slew of diorama shows coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, Freeze is looking to do a focus section. So a solo show there of dioramas, a show in Milan, of, and I think it was just, this work was so physically demanding. Mm-hmm. The scale of it was just like, it feels so good now to have everything in my, literally uh, in my hands. Right, I right, like, right. don't have to hire someone to do this well. They like just these, the it, this show broke my bank. I went like, if I, and I think it's important sometimes that artists do talk about finance and production yeah. and the things involved. I took the risk being like, this is my first, U.S. solo institution show, I'm going all in. Right. Because I may, you know, who knows? And I'm so glad I did. Like, I may, I, 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 maybe there'll be an opportunity to make something of this scale again. It looks like there might be. But if I don't, I'm so content right now working contained with objects that I find on the streets and just, yeah. Yeah. It feels, it feels very natural. Like, it just rolled into, oh, and then these offers for these diorama exhibitions and knowing that I wanted to make this work because it was portable and uh, it was personal, and especially the time where we can't touch things. I want, once we kind of get through this, the Mm -hmm. next show that I do where everybody can touch the work, where it Mm -hmm. gets that energy of hands. That's the biggest thing I love about the dioramas is that these boxes from the, how many hands, again, that idea of uh, genetic imagination of frequency and energy how many hands have held this? The first intent when you've given this gift, engagement rings from great grandparents, all sorts of crazy things, you know, that the boxes have uh, have been used for. Right. It just feels fitting, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I have a beautiful little studio in Munich. My partner, her uncle, is a is an accomplished artist. And he reached out and he was like, hey, I've got a little workshop room and you can use this. And then uh, I reached out uh, through my partner to uh, the art society out here, and I got a line on a really great studio for once things kind of re- return to the new new normal. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm continuing to produce in a different way. I'm not necessarily thinking so much about exhibitions, just producing for the fuck for the love, just ideas. I don't Absolutely. know what the themes of these shows will be, and I don't care about that. I just want to make, make, make. You know. Yeah, you'll find it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I want to end with a passage that I, I picked for you. Okay. Which is here. Okay. The notion oh, of <laughs> Antilina, Antilin, Antilanite, or Caribbeanness, emerges from a reality that we will have to question, but also corresponds to a dream that we must clarify and whose legitimacy must be demonstrated. A fragile reality, the experience of Caribbeanness, woven together from one side of the Caribbean to the other, negatively twisted together in its urgency, Caribbeanness as a dream forever denied, often deferred, yet a strange, stubborn presence in our responses. This reality is there in essence, dense, inscribed in fact, but threatened, not inscribed in consciousness. The dream is vital, but not obvious. In these shows, I feel like you've sort of elicited that dream and so it's here oh, for our thank consciousness you. thank you thank you so much this was wonderful it was nice to nice to talk with you i'm glad that we did this yeah me too thanks so much curtis no problem
All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye.